Food insecurity risk is highly global and it has contributed to the slow recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. This has been made worse by the Russia-Ukraine war, but there are some good news in the terms of more grains being available after both warring parties agreed to sell the available stocks. Meanwhile, the recovery of Bitcoin seems to be on a shaky ground and China is assuring the public of the safety of using its central bank digital currency. We will be looking at these discussions on the show today. Thanks for joining us. This is Business Edge. I am Nikon Onobanjo. Let's start with the African business headlines. And now the African Development Fund, a subsidiary of the African Development Bank, has approved a $5.4 million grant to support Somalia's food security programs. EFDB's East Africa Regional Director General Ms. Nenawa Bufo said the money would help address the impact of the prolonged drought and the added impact of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which have deepened food insecurity in the country. That adds to Monday's announcement by Samantha Power, the U.S. Agency for International Development Administrator, that is USAID, that agency will provide another $1.3 billion in additional critical humanitarian and development assistance to help stave off mass starvation and debts. Ghana's central bank unexpectedly left its benchmark interest rate unchanged on signs that rampant inflation may be leveling off and concerns for the outlook of economic growth is deteriorating. The Monetary Policy Committee maintained the policy rate at 19%. Governor Ernest Addison told reporters on Monday in the capital, Accra, that after cumulative rate hikes of 550 basis points since November. Now, while annual consumer inflation is at a near 19-year high and almost tripling the ceiling of the central bank's 6% to 10% target band, it increased at a slower pace in June and month-on-month -month price growth has decelerated in the past two months. Anglo Platinum's share price has dropped more than 50% since its peak in March this year. This says how radically the fundamentals for platinum group metals have changed in just a few months. Weaker PGM prices, 10% mine inflation, and 4% drop in production pushed profits down 43% for the half year to June 2022. Amplat's share price is back to where it was pre-COVID, suggesting the post-COVID boom is well and truly behind. An update comes after South Africa's largest fuel producer declared a force majeure on the supply of petroleum products from Natref on July 15, following delivery delays of crude oil to the refinery. Startup is expected towards the end of July 2022, and according to what we know, the current um, plans are set to be in place to maintain supply to customers and minimize any potential disruptions, and that is according to the company. And those are the headlines for you this morning. Let's quickly go on a break and when we return, we will start the conversation proper on Business Edge. Do stay with us. Grain important nations, especially many in Africa, will get much needed relief if Russia upholds the agreement it made with Ukraine to resume grain exports. Given that Ukraine has over 22 million tons of grain, wheat, maize, sunflower, seed, and other grains contained, stored in silos, the relief would be substantial due to infrastructural disruption brought on by Russia's invasion and attacks on cargo ships. It has been unable to move these commodities to export markets. Ukraine is a significant exporter of grains and oil seeds worldwide. Therefore, the export embargo has contributed to the world's considerable rise in the price of agricultural commodities. And this chaotic scenario was intended to be changed by the Green Deal, which was struck on July 22, 2022, between Kiev and Moscow. As part of the agreement, Russia agreed to refrain from attacking grain ships in the Black Sea region, but this assurance was short-lived because Russian missiles attacked the important Ukrainian port of Odessa less than 24 hours after the agreement was signed. 
At the signing, Turkey's president commented on the deal, thought to have cautioned on the fragility of the situation, but also praised the process with the authorities of Ukraine and Russia. Let's listen to him in this excerpt. Önümüzdeki günlerde başlayacak gemi trafiği ile Karadeniz'den dünyanın birçok ülkesine yeni bir nefes borusu açmış olacağız. Gemilerin çıkışından güvenli bir şekilde intikaline ve varacağı limana ulaşmasına kadar tüm süreçler üzerinde mutabakat tesis edildi. Bu son derece önemli planın icrası ve denetimi İstanbul'da kurulacak müşterek koordinasyon merkezi tarafından gerçekleştirilecektir. І зараз не тільки можемо відновити роботу наших портів на Чорному морі, але й зберігаємо для них потрібний захист. Це відпрацьовано з нашими військовими і з нашою розвідкою. Військові запевнили мене у 100% контролі підходів до наших портів. Близько 20 мільйонів тонн минулорічного врожаю зернових підуть на експорт. Цьогорічний врожай, а він вже збирається, також можна буде реалізувати. Це доходи фермерів усього аграрного сектору і державного бюджету. Це робочі місця, це кошти для посівної наступного року. У нас зараз вже в наявності зерна приблизно на 10 мільярдів доларів. Нарешті є шанс знизити гостроту продовольчої кризи, яку спровокувала Росія. Є шанс не допустити глобальної катастрофи, голоду, який міг призвести до політичного хаосу в багатьох країнах світу в том числе в Краинах, які нам допомагают. And that is the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, talking about optimism about the pact signed with Russia. And of course, the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, also saying that this will be good for both countries and of course are other countries that are affected in terms of export and import of grains and cereals. So joining us from Lagos, Nigeria, is Victor Aluyi, Senior Vice President and Head Investments, Global Sankore Investments. A beautiful morning to you. Thank you so much, Victor, for joining us on Business Edge. Thanks for having me. So there you watched uh, the interviews and, of course, uh, what um, the president of Ukraine said and that of um, Turkey. And um, looking at it, most commodities are said to be bought with a futures contract to set the price of an agreed level uh, despite a supply occurring at a future date. So looking at um, all this situation, uh, can both Russia and Ukraine fulfill this contract? Well, I think that, you know, the agreement that was signed is certainly a step in the right direction. And, and the idea is to ensure that, uh, you know, both Russia and Ukraine, particularly Ukraine, is um, able to uh, contribute significantly in meeting, um, you know, these contracts. I mean, for context, uh, both Russia and Ukraine account for about a third of global grain supply. You're talking wheat, you're talking maize, uh, other grains, sunflower and coal, you know, so since the... Um, you know, advent of the conflict in, in Russia, uh, you basically had, um, you know, grains that have been trapped in silos across Ukraine. Uh, the estimate is that you have around 22 million tons uh, that have been trapped in, in, in silos across Ukraine. Obviously, because of the conflict, uh, these grains are unable to leave the silos and get on the high sea uh, to get to the destination of people who actually need them. You know, for, for a bit of context, you've seen you know, commodity prices, you know, rise quite significantly in the aftermath of that conflict. You know, uh, we saw wheat, for instance, which is a major uh, commodity, rose about 38% in two weeks after the invasion. Uh, Com prices rose about 17% after the invasion. Sunflower prices rose about 48% just three weeks after the invasion. You know, so uh, we saw a significant uptick in commodity prices. And um, that was just on the back of the fact that uh, the, the expectation was that a major supply hub was going to be cut off from the global supply of uh, major commodities. And, and that's why we saw that sort of strong uptick in prices. However, we've seen um, a retracement or a correction really in those prices uh, over the last couple of months, just basically on the back of the fact that um, there are you know, increasing concerns of a, of a slowdown um, in the global economy. And that has played into um, you know, the prices of these various commodities, uh, wheat prices, 
right now are even 16% below uh, their pre-invasion levels. Home prices are 13% below pre-invasion levels. Sunflower prices are lower by 6.5% than where they were before the invasion happened. If you even look at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization price index, which is basically a measure of um, international prices of, you know, the basket of, you know, food, food prices, uh, it's down about 2% in June, and that's the third monthly decline, really. So uh, we've been seeing that sort of decline, you know, over the last couple of months. But, but, but I think that the idea for this agreement is to, you know, even increase uh, global supply and, and further uh, reduce the inflationary pressure that we've seen on food prices across the globe. So I think that this agreement should significantly improve the ability of both Russia and Ukraine to increase global supply and by extension the ability of traders to also meet those supply um, contracts as they fall due. Well, of course, um, the improvement or the rise in global supply of wheat and grain will mean a lot for countries and, of course, African countries that have um, witnessed a shortfall in these um, commodities. And, of course, it will also mean so much for Ukraine right now because it will give them the opportunity to ship out um, these commodities that has been in store for quite a while now. But then some people are doubting the sincerity on the part of Russia because, as we know it, Russia's um, uh, foreign minister is said to be in Africa and some observers yeah. are saying that this could be um, a charm offensive because it's more like trying to woo Africa and woo other countries to be on your side rather than looking at the primary importance of what the deal should um, signify which is to see that there's enough um, commodities moving from that access to other countries that are needing it so what is your take on this postulation I mean, I think that the, you know, the visit by Sergei Lavrov, particularly to Egypt, is a, it's a diplomatic one. I mean, in the aftermath of the invasion, you would see that most African countries essentially refrain from, you know, voting to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I think that was also quite strategic. Um, Africa sources a, a sizable portion of its grains, um, you know, from, from Russia and Ukraine. I mean, Africa spends about 80 billion importing, um, you know, grains, mainly wheat, uh, palm oil and others uh, every year. SSC, that's also in Africa, spends about 40 billion. And just slightly below 8 billion of all that is from Russia and Ukraine, which is really significant. Um, you know, I think what, you know, Sergei Lavrov is doing in Africa is just to try and, um, you know, build you up stronger diplomatic ties with, with African countries, essentially assuring them of, you know, continued, um, you know, grain supply. Um, but, but I think those that have um, expressed skepticism about, you know, uh, this agreement uh, have done so rightfully. Uh, I mean, uh, just before the invasion, uh, Vladimir Putin kept reassuring that, you know, there wasn't going to be an invasion and, and, and sure enough, he did invade, you know. So if Russia has agreed to this, it really remains to be seen. Um, if they will pull through with it. We recall that, um, you know, part of the concerns that Russia had expressed was that, um, you know, they, they don't want a situation where these shipments are then used as the guys to carry weapons um, into the port of Odessa to continue to support the Ukrainian efforts. So what they've asked is that, um, you know, they would also search, you know, the ships that, uh, you know, are applying those routes. Uh, it will basically go through from the port of Odessa through the Black Sea uh, to, to, to the northern border of Turkey, and then through the Mediterranean to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, really, it, it remains to be seen if, uh, you know, Russia would, would uh, you know, uh, hold its own side of the bargain properly. Uh, the attack uh, that happened, uh, you know, yesterday again, just continues to uh, provide uh, impetus for, for, for disbelief, uh, you know, with regards to the deal. But again, Russia has said that it basically targeted, you know, an, an arms depot around there, you know, so still a lot of uncertainty around the agreement. But I think that just on the news of the fact that, you know, both parties are speaking and have then gone ahead to, to sign an agreement, recall that this agreement is actually brokered by the United Nations and Turkey, you know, so I, I think it provides a bit more credence uh, to the agreement to be able to leverage Russia in particular to, to stick to its own side of the bargain. Now, uh, since the Russia onslaught on Ukraine, there's been this dire uh, friction between Russia and the West and, of course, uh, Europe. But then uh, looking at uh, the pact that has been signed now, do you think that it will have any impact on the array of uh, sanctions on Russia? And do you think it will lead to the resumption of commerce between Russia and the West? Well, I think this might just be a first step in that direction. Um, anything in terms of relationships thawing, you know, uh, it, it requires that these sanctions get out of the way. And, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take quite a while. Obviously, 
this whole agreement needs to be put in place. Uh, it needs to be seen that um, you know Russia is holding its own side of the bargain, and then we can obviously start having conversations around maybe the rolling back of sanctions, which will certainly take some time. Um, you know, so uh, there's still some way to go in terms of you know relationships normalizing particularly trade relationships between Russia and the West. There, there's still quite some, some way to go, really. And I think well, these are just um, early days yet. All right, um, Victor, like we emphasized earlier, this particular deal will mean a lot for African countries. It will be a major breakthrough for them in terms of getting these um, commodities and this food stuff uh, into their country. But then, um, do you think that it would have any significant impact or immediate impact um, on African countries? And, um, of course, uh, should we be expecting these grains or these cereals or even wheat to come to the African ports uh, anytime soon? Again, it's, it's probably going to take some time. Like I highlighted earlier, there's still a bit of uncertainty around that agreement, particularly with the, with the missile strike that was carried out by Russia um, you know, just yesterday. It, it just creates a bit more uncertainty around how this is exactly going to work. Um, you know, but, but I think that once the first set of shipments leave that port, yeah, we can then begin to talk about improved supply globally. And of course, you know, a good amount of that will certainly make its way um, you know, to the African continent. I mean, Egypt by far is the most dependent on Russian um, Ukrainian grains in Africa. And, and then you have um, the likes of Sudan, Nigeria, Tanzania, Algeria, South Africa, and Co. So I think that, um, you know, once this is properly ironed out, uh, I believe that, um, you know, we, we should see those grains start to move. But uh, in the absence of that, um, you know, it's still all just within the realm of sentiment, in spite of the fact that this agreement has been signed and reached. All right, thank you so much, Victor. We will continue with the conversation, but we need to go on a break. And when we return, we still want to be sure if um, Russia is willing to follow through with this deal because, of course, um, when you um, have a pact signed and in the next 24 hours you are attacking somewhere near the seaport, Odessa, very strategic place for Ukraine uh, as of that matter, then people are, some people are skeptical if Russia is um, willing to be true to its words. So we get to look at that when we return from this break. Now, if Russia keeps to the deal that has signed with Ukraine allowing for the resumption of grain exports much needed relief no doubt will be provided to importing countries including many in Africa and it would be significant as Ukraine has roughly 22 million tons we said that earlier on in a silos and people are wondering if this um, would help Ukraine um, dispatch what it has in a store and of course help African countries get commodities that are in deficit in terms of demands within that access. So let's quickly run off on a break and when we return the conversation will continue. Ukraine is a notable player in global grain and oil seeds export market and thus the blockage of exports has contributed to the notable increase in agricultural commodity prices observed since the war started. Now under this agreement, Russia promised not to attack grain vessels in the Black Sea region, but this promise didn't last long. In less than 24 hours after the deal was signed, Russian missiles struck that critical Ukrainian port of Odessa, and this gives room for speculations that the deal cannot be relied on. So even as we continue to look at um, what it means for Ukraine and Russia, Victor, now, before we go to that side, let's look at Egypt. Egypt has been making alternative moves in terms of um, getting supplies, and um, of recent, it went to India to get wheat supplies to uh, mitigate the shortfalls that it has experienced. So would, do you think that this um, sort of agreement uh, between the th two countries um, is something that um, is laudable, fine, laudable in the sense that it is something that we can bank on, it is something that we can rely on, it is something that we can believe in, it is something that would help even other African countries get a bit of reprieve? Well, I think that if you look at the uh, a bit of background or history of how this conflict has evolved uh, with regards to um, believing what, what uh, Russia has said and its position, uh, then, then this situation kind of creates a, a, a bit of a concern. Like I highlighted earlier, uh, I mean, uh, back in December when Russia was massing troops on the Ukrainian border and Western intelligence kept saying that Russia was going to attack, uh, you know, Russia insisted that it wasn't going to attack. But it actually ended up, you know, attacking. 
you know, so it, it, it, it makes it a bit more challenging. It makes it sort of difficult to, you know, um, just take what Russia says, hook, line, and sinker. And, and that has even been further gravitated by the attack that we saw uh, just barely 24 hours after the agreement uh, had been signed. I mean, the ink barely drying on that paper, you know. So I think it creates uh, a bit more uncertainty. Uh, like I said, I think this is a case of when the rubber hits the road. We, we really need to see um, how this will pan out in terms of, um, you know, those grain shipments actually moving. I mean, what, what Ukraine had done basically was to, you know, in the aftermath of the conflict or the invasion was to basically heavily mine that port to ensure that uh, they prevent an amphibious landing that would see, you know, uh, a further Russian offensive. So part of what this agreement entails is that um, those uh, areas that have been heavily mined will be demined to ensure that ships can move safely. But again, they, they, they've asked for assurances that, um, you know, Russia will refrain from an amphibious attack. You know, so uh, Russia, again, is also saying that uh, they want to ensure that these ship movements are not used as a guise to move um, you know, weapons to the port of Odessa to support the Ukrainian resistance effort. You know, so a, a bit of uncertainty. I mean, these are issues that had been, um, you know, on the floor actually before this agreement was signed. So I, I believe sense, but, but, but, but again, that, that missile strike, um, you know, was just, uh, uh, I would say, a, a wrong move and, and it has just created even greater uncertainty, um, you know, for how this agreement would progress going forward. Okay, okay, Victor, worst case scenario, um, if Russia rescinds on the agreement and uh, this deal collapses, how would it affect the international market? Well, I, I think we're, we're probably just going to see a knee jerk reaction in commodity prices. Like I highlighted earlier, commodity prices have been on a downward trend over the last two months. I mean, the, the sort of upswing that we saw in the aftermath of the invasion, um, commodity prices have basically lost all of that upside. Uh, you know, uh, and this is just on the back of you know concerns uh, around the you know a significant slowdown in the global economy, uh, and these are demand side issues. So yeah, well, if, if this deal doesn't pull through, uh, uh, you know, eventually it will be a case where we'll see a quick uh, knee jerk reaction, you know, in commodity prices, and and that I believe will be short lived because there are other bigger issues, particularly on the demand side. Uh, that will continue to put a lead on how far these commodity prices can go. All right, moving forward now, looking at the situation, um, uh, could a similar deal or a negotiation for the Nord 2 stream pipeline um, happen now? Should we be looking at some positives or a progression in terms of um, how this conversation is going? I think for Nord Stream 2, that's going to be on hold, uh, probably even suspended. I think the conversation really is around uh, Nord Stream 1. I mean, Nord Stream 1, is essentially the largest, uh, you know, gas evacuation infrastructure uh, that goes into Europe. It carries about 55 million uh, uh, metric tons of gas on a yearly basis, uh, you know, to Europe. Um, you know, so uh, there have been fears around, you know, the the maintenance work that was carried on uh, last week. There were fears around the fact that Russia wasn't going to turn that back on, but it did. I mean, there, there are also indications that Russia is going to reduce the throughput. Uh, through that uh, pipeline. So for Nord Stream 2, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, European countries starting to look elsewhere for gas. Uh, there, there are talks with, with Qatar. We're seeing Germany beginning to look at the possibility of certainly building out, um, you know, LNG port infrastructure that ensure that they can get like a liquefied natural gas through ports and not, and not pipes. Um, you know, so uh, these are issues that, um, you know, the European countries are certainly having to grapple with at this time. So for Nord Stream 2, uh, I think that conversation would be in the cooler for now. All right, um, Victor, before I let you go, we know that EU for a few weeks now has been pushing for gas supplies in Africa. There's been a lot of um, conversation and a lot of engagements with African countries in order to get enough gas, um, in order to assure of the deficits that Europe is suffering as of now. But then, um, do you think that EU will continue to negotiate with African countries with this deal, or do you think it will continue to stay with the supplier, believing that enough supply will come uh, for its energy use? I mean, in terms of conversation, really, the EU is probably talking more with the US and Qatar, right? Um, the US is, is the largest producer of, of, of natural gas. Um, you know, the, the major challenge is just that um, these gas supplies would have to be taken, you know, through ships. Uh, it would then have to be liquefied, put on those ships and then ships to Europe. Same thing for Qatar. So I don't know that there's any significant conversation between Europe and Africa. I think it's more really with the United States and, and, and Qatar. 
again, it, it, it's important that, you know, with what has happened geopolitically, Europe begins to look at um, sort of winning itself off of its uh, huge dependence on Russian energy. And part of that conversation is to look at how, you know, they can channel more energy or gas supplies, particularly from the United States and from the Middle East, and, you know, just try to secure, uh, you know, the energy future for Europe. Also, alternative energy sources are being considered, uh, you know, but again, I think that, um, the the way forward really would be for for europe to consider major alternatives to its uh continued dependence on russian um, energy all right so uh, we want to believe that if russia can stay true to its agreements then it will mean a lot for europe it will mean a lot for africa Absolutely. and probably for the time being people will be able to smile and get uh, what is needed in terms of their needs but then thank you so much victor lee for joining the conversation Thanks this morning me. All Thank right, you, so uh, if Russia keeps its word, as we are saying, the benefits will be immediate and, of course, long term, and it will help a whole lot of people. Grain prices could soften as more as grain supplies are available in the world market. Overall, this would be a good development for consumers, particularly those living in poor developing countries countries and so um we will pause with the conversation for now when we go on a break and return we will bring you international business news do stay with us this is business edge <laughs>